Okay, thanks for the introduction. I'm going to talk about this heavy hammer that uh, Stefano was talking about. Um, so we've seen a bit already, but I will nevertheless introduce it in my own terminology. Two basic primitives in symmetric crypto are pseudorandom permutations like block ciphers and pseudorandom functions. And historically, um, it is a topic in symmetric crypto to relate these two uh, primitives. This dates back to the, uh, to the loopy rack of construction. The Faisal networks who use a PRF and design a PRP on top of this. However, if you look at it, it makes more sense to do it the other way around because people know how to build a PRP and don't know how to uh, natively build an efficient PRF. So in this work, we look at the other way around. And a very famous construction in this direction was the one that Stefano showed two slides ago was the sum of permutations or the XOR of permutations. Um, so quickly go over it. We have two block cipher calls calling it uh, with a secret key, P1 and P2. The, st uh, the input goes into both and the output gets XORed. The scheme dates back to Balara and friends in 1998 and various results, including the one from two slides back, I didn't add it, I'm sorry, uh, prove optimal security of the scheme. There's many applications. There is also a variant with a single key uh, primitive, so you use one block cipher evaluation uh, and the input gets just prepended with a bit to do domain separation. Um, at Crypto last year, uh, Koliati and Serain introduced Encrypted Davis Meyer. And Encrypted Davis Meyer also uses two block cipher calls um, with a secret key, P1 and P2. The input value goes into the first block cipher call and then it gets fed forward over the first call and then the resulting value gets encrypted again. Koliati and Serain proved security up to 2 to the 2n over 3 queries and conjectured that this construction is in fact optimally secure. Um, they actually had EDM as a side result, namely they focused on encrypted Wakeman Carter Davis Meyer, um, conveniently abbreviated to EWCDM, and essentially it's a non-spaced um, MAC function, it gets its input to nonce, and the nonce goes through EDM, and in the middle you XOR a universal hash function call evaluated on the message. And also this MAC function was proven secure up to 2 to the 2n over 3, and conjectured to be optimal security, to be optimally secure. And in this work, we prove optimal security up to some small loss. And more detail will prove that encrypted Davis Meyer and encrypted Davis Meyer dual are secure up to 2 to the n divided by n. So 2 to the n um, divided by a small logarithmic loss. In addition, we look at encrypted Davis Meyer, so forget about the dashed line. And we thought, well, it makes more sense to do the feed forward over the second block cipher call. So if you look at the dual, so this is what we call encrypted Davis Meyer dual. It's the same construction, but then the feed forward goes over the second block cipher call. And we proved that encrypted Davis Meyer dual, which is equally efficient, is optimally secure. And those are the main contributions of our work. Um, in an earlier version, we also had a dual of the MAC function, but Maridul found, uh, pointed out that we made a very stupid mistake in the proof, so we removed uh, the scheme. Um, so the but the main focus is encrypted Davis Meyer and encrypted Davis Meyer, a dual. And the backbone of the analysis is the, this, this uh, heavy hammer, it's a mirror theory. And I think the mirror theory is a very powerful approach in achieving optimal security. At a high level, the idea is essentially a combinatorial, uh, combinatorial uh, problem. So suppose we have, in this case, R, R unknowns. So uh, this beautiful P, calligraphic P, denotes R distinct unknowns. So we know that they are distinct, but they are unknown. And we have Q equations over these R unknowns of this form. So PAI plus PBI is lambda I, and the lambdas are, of course, known. So we have R unknowns and Q equations, and there is some implicit surjection. So um, if, for instance, phi of A1 is phi of A2, then these are the, th the same unknowns. So there is an implicit uh, surjection here, but essentially the problem is we have Q equations over R unknowns, and the goal is to derive a lower bound on the number of solutions to the unknowns such that they are all distinct. It's a very combinatorial problem, right? Um, but it has many applications. Um, Pau, uh, Paterin derived an extremely, lower fo uh, extremely powerful lower bound on this um, number of solutions. Uh, but for some reason, it has remained unnoticed in the field of, of crypto for a long time. So it, it was introduced back in 2003. Um, it has been used by some, in some articles, but not many. And to give you an impression how unknown it has remained since the introduction 14 years ago, I added a list of all results that use Patrin's mirror theory. 
So it starts, of course, with the original publication. It was still on suboptimal bound in 2003. Uh, later, Paterin used it in 2004. Uh, Paterin used it in 2005. Optimal security. Um, who's next? Paterin and Montreuil proved it in 2005. Paterin proved it, used it in 2008. Um, Paterin used it in 2008, again. Uh, Paterin, in 2010, Paterin used it for the sum of permutations, the concrete bound, finally. Uh, Paterin used it in 2010 for the Feistel construction. Um, I guess you see the pattern, right? Um, Paterin used it in 2013 for the sum of permutations and improved bound. Uh, ah, yes, Coliati, Lamp, and Paterin proved it, uh, used it to prove a uh, XOR of multiple permutations. Um, so what's next? Volten, Ashef, and Mariere used it beginning the uh, previous year for a Faisal network. So this is the first article that does not include uh, Paterin. <laughs> but some people among you may recognize these names. Those were close authors and students of Paterin. <laughs> um, so uh, only in the end of last year, we applied it. Um, so that's who me and Damian were. Uh, we are not. Uh, we, have don't, we don't have any relation with Paterin. Um, <laughs> but we found out that this result actually proved security of c -Ang, optimal security of the c -Ang encryption scheme from 2006. In fact, the result from 2005 proved that c -Ang of 2006 was optimally secure. And it has remained rather unknown, even though it is a powerful technique. And I'm going to explain you the uh, technique at a high level and to think about the, the technique to get the intuition, it makes sense to think of the system of equations as a graph. So recall we have R unknowns and Q equations, and we can visualize this in terms of a graph. So this graph consists of R nodes and Q edges. In this case, for instance, PA1 plus PB1 is lambda1. This means that we add this edge labeled by lambda1 into this graph. In this case, also PA1 equals PA2, which effectively means that the phi of A1 is the phi of A2. So we can transform the system of R equa uh, Q equations with R nodes into a graph with R nodes and Q edges. And now we're going to lower bound the number of solutions, but let's first look at three silly examples, three toy examples. And the first one is rather simple. We have three equations and two unknowns. Three unknowns and two equations, I'm sorry. Uh, PA plus PB is lambda 1, PB plus PC is lambda 2. We have this nice graph associated with it. And now we're going to lower bound the number of solutions to the unknowns. But it's obvious that if lambda 1 is 0, for instance, then the first equation reads PA equals PB. And that's impossible. That's a contradiction because the unknown should be distinct. So in this case, we have zero solutions, and we call the scheme degenerate. Also, if lambda 2 is 0, it is degenerate. If lambda 1 equals lambda 2, we can sum the two equations and we see that PA should be equal to PC, which is also a contradiction. And we call in either of these cases, we call the scheme degenerate. Briefly looking forward, degeneracy means that there is a path in this graph of which the sum of the labels is zero. Now suppose it's not degenerate, so the lambda i's are non-zero and they are distinct. Now we're just going to fix the, some solutions. So we first fix 2 to the n. Well, P, the unknowns are n-bit values. We have two to the n possible choices for PA. But once PA is fixed, this fixes PB. Because B, PB is lambda 1 XOR PA. And PB is, of course, different from PA because lambda 1 is non-zero. This, in turn, fixes PC because PC is lambda 2 plus PB. So in total, we have two to the n solutions to the system. A more complicated example is this. More it's actually more complicated, even though it looks simpler. We have two equations and four unknowns. So PA plus PB is lambda 1. PC plus PD is lambda 2. Again, we have degeneracy if lambda 1 or lambda 2 is 0, for the same reason as before. So suppose we have different uh, non-zero lambda 1 and lambda 2. We're again, just going to count the number of solutions. We have two to the n possible choices for PA. This fixes. PA, and it hence fixes PB. Um, but now the question is, how many choices do we have for PC and PD? Well, we require that PC is not equal to PA and PB, because the unknowns are distinct. PD, which is defined as lambda 2 plus PC, should also be unequal to PA and PB. 
Essentially, this means that we have at least 2 to the n minus cho 4 choices for PC. And the total number of solutions is at least 2 to the n times 2 to the n minus 4. Could be more, but we have at least this. And this is how the, the lower bound technique works. A uh, third example is when we have a circle. So we have three equations, three unknowns, and we have a beautiful circle. Uh, for simplicity, assume we have non-degeneracy, so the lambda i's are non-zero, lambda i is not equal to lambda j. Um, suppose now that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is not equal to zero. In this case, if we sum the three equations, we see that we should actually have lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is zero. So if this is the case, we have zero solutions, and we, call that, we say that the scheme contains a circle for obvious reasons, because it contains a circle. Um, if the lambdas sum to zero, we don't have a contradiction, but essentially we have a redundant equation. We can get rid of the last equation without loss of generality, and we're back at example one. And this is a little bit the technique behind the mirror theory, and more generally, we see two types of problems. So problem one is when there is a circle of size at least two, and problem two is when there is a degeneracy, meaning that there is a path of length at least one, of which the labels sum to zero. And Patrin now proved the following powerful result. He proves that if the system of equations is circle-free and non-degenerate, then the number of solutions to the unknowns is at least uh, 2 to the n falling factorial r divided by 2 to the n q. So to be clear, this 2 to the n with a subscript r means 2 to the n, 2 to the n minus 1, 2 to the n minus 2, up to 2 to the n minus r plus 1. Uh, divided by 2 to the nq, where q is the number of equations are the unknowns. And that's what Petrin proved, provided that the maximum tree size xi satisfies xi minus 1 squared times r is at most uh, 2 to the n divided by the magical number 67. And so that's the technical condition for the proof. Um, and to see the power of this mirror theory, let's look at this sum of permutations. Um, and I will focus on the single permutation variant. So we have one permutation with domain separation in front of it. So domain separation in front of it. And consider an adversary, adversary that gets a transcript consisting of Q evaluations of the scheme. Every evaluation kind of defines two inputs to the permutation, right? So we have Xi goes to P of zero concatenated with Xi and of one concatenated with Xi. And if you define these values as PAI and PBI, every tuple, every query that the attacker makes corresponds to an equation. So we have Q equations of this form, PAI plus PBI is YI by design. We have two Q unknowns because the inputs to the permutations are always different. So we have two Q unknowns and Q equations. If you draw the graph, you just have a few lines. So the, the, this is essentially the graph. Uh, Q queries, they are disconnected. It's clear that the scheme has no circle. So there is no circle in the picture. It is non-degenerate provided that there is no path of which the labels sum to zero. Essentially, this means that there is, uh, this is non-degenerate as long as the yi's are not equal to zero for all i's. In addition, the maximum tree size is two. And if you apply the mirror theory, we see that if 2q is at most two to the power n divided by 67, we have at least two to the n falling factorial 2q divided by two to the nq solutions to the unknowns. That's the mirror theory. The question now is how to uh, use this. Um, I will quickly go over it because of time, and it's, it's a very simple approach. It's using the H-coefficient technique. And the H-coefficient technique consists of looking at all possible transcripts. So everything the attacker can see is all possible transcripts, and to divide these transcripts into good ones and bad ones. And then the goal is for good ones proof that the probability that you get a good transcript in the real for the real construction uh, divided by the probability that you get a bad trans transcript in the ideal construction is close to 1. And then the security bound is upper bounded by uh, this epsilon plus the probability that you actually get a bad transcript in the random world. So this is a very famous proof technique. In our case, we say that a transcript is bad if the corresponding graph is degenerate. Because in that case, we cannot apply the mirror theory. So saying that the transcript is bad if the, tra if the graph is degenerate means that the transcript is bad if there is a y that is zero. And recall, if you go back to the construction quickly, y can never be zero in this case. So it makes sense. 
And in the random world, y can be 0. In the real world, it cannot be 0. The probability that you get a bad transcript is about q over 2 to the n. And then for the analysis of good transcript, what it boils down to, I'll quickly go over it. It's a bit technical, but essentially what it means is you have to um, compute the number of permutations that fit to a certain transcript. So given the transcript, derive a lower bound on the number of permutations that fit this transcript. And this is what mirror theory does, because here we see the bound from the mirror theory. Um, this is the number of solutions. The probability that you get any of these solutions is this term times the probability that you get one of these. Uh, for the random one, you just get 2 to the n q. And if you do the math, you will find epsilon is 0, and you get uh, q over 2 to the n security. And that's how the mirror theory use, works for the uh, sum of permutations. Uh, this is not my proof. So this was all from Paterin. Um, but now encrypted Davies-Meyer. Encrypted Davies-Meyer is different because it's sequential. It's not a sum of permutations, right? Uh, well, if you look at it a bit closer, it is. Because if the attacker gets the transcript, and if you fix the transcript, it boils down to a computation of the number of permutations that fit the transcript. Now, um, yeah, look at the picture. So the x goes fat forward to the middle. We just put it from the top. It's the same scheme, right? But if the transcript is fixed, the arrows in the scheme don't matter that much anymore. So we are just going to swap the arrows for P2. So the EMD, encrypted Davis Meyer, is essentially a sum of permutations in the middle. And now we can apply the, the mirror theory. In more detail, if you have one query, it corresponds to two evaluations, namely P1 of xi, which I define as PAI, P2 inverse of yi, which I define as PBI, and then we have a system of Q equations of the form PAI plus PBI is xy. It is a bit different from the mirror theory, from the, the sum of permutations, because in this case, the y values can collide. So the x values are always unique, the y values can collide, and this means that the PBIs may collide. If you now draw the graph, you don't have just edges. Well, you also have edges, but the edges can uh, collide. So here the PAIs, they correspond to the input to uh, the first permutation. Those are always distinct. But we could have collisions at the y side. So in this case, we have a, uh, various trees. This is the tree with xi1 edges. So this means you have a xi1 fault collision on the y's. So this is how the intuitively the, the graph looks like now. Again. We're going to apply the mirror theory but, theory, but now a small relaxation because we use different permutations. Uh, it is circle-free, right? It's obviously circle-free. You can see it from the picture. It is non-degenerate. Um, I need to note here that we use different permutations. So if, for instance, x1 is 0, it doesn't matter because we use different permutations. But if you have a path of length 2, of which you label sum to 0, then you have a problem. But the x's are all distinct, so you never have a problem. The maximum tree size is xi plus 1, provided there is no xi plus 1 fault collision in the y value. And then you, do the, you apply Patras mirror theory, and you find that if xi squared times q is at most 2 to the n divided by 67, you have at most this number of solutions to the unknowns. And I'm going to um, make a shortcut to the uh, conclusion, and we find that the security of encrypted Davis Meyer is at most q over 2 to the n, which comes from the loss using the relaxation of the mirror theory, plus q choose xi plus 1 divided by 2 to the n xi, which is the probability that you have a multi-collision, and hence a violation of the tree size. And that's a, the technique used for encrypted Davis-Meyer. You can do the same thing for encrypted wigman carter davis meyer um, So recall that in, in encrypted wigman carter davis meyer the nonce is always unique, but you have a message uh, of which the hash value goes in here. Um, so we, we again swap the arrows. We have a sum of permutations in the middle. Um, two evaluations. So the, well, xi goes to pai, yi goes to pbi. We have a system of q equations of the form pai plus pbi is, and in this case we get the new i plus the age of mi. So as before, the x's are the nonces are unique. The, the, this should be new and this should be t. Hmm. The nonces are always unique. The t's could collide. But in addition, these values could collide. So the, the graph now looks essentially the same, but you have a problem if you have degeneracy. Again, we have no circle. Degeneracy happens if you have two edges in the same graph with the same label. 
So if in the same tree you have two edges with the same label, you have a problem. And this corresponds essentially to the remaining term. Because this one we saw for encrypted Davis Meyer, this one we saw for encrypted Davis Meyer. This is the probability that within one tree you get two the same labels. So Q choose two times epsilon, where epsilon is the quality of the universal hash function divided by two to the n. Now for encrypted Davis Meyer dual, um, we can also prove it using mirror theory, but we did it in a simpler way. And the proof is essentially by picture. It's, it's really a simple proof. Because this is encrypted Davis Meyer, we can redraw it. It's the same scheme. So instead of feed, uh, doing the feed forward here, we doing the feed forward from the beginning, but we permute it. It's the same picture. Is it, well, it's a different picture, but the same scheme. But the permutations P1 and P2 are independent random permutations. So why don't we just replace this by a random permutation, say P3? And these are probabilistically equivalent. And this is the sum of permutations, which is optimally secure. So encrypted Davis Meyer dual is at least as secure as the sum of permutations. And we get optimal security, which is better security than encrypted Davis Meyer. And I quickly want to go to future research. Um, and one interesting question is what happens if the permutations are the same? For encrypted Davis Meyer and encrypted Wegman Cartel Davis Meyer, the trick doesn't work anymore because the trick we used in the proof is, to, is, is uh, that we invert P2. So the trick is that we keep P1 as it is, but we invert P2. But if the permutations are the same, you cannot just invert one. Um, and the trick really fails, and we don't see any way to prove it. Uh, for EDMD, we also don't see a way to prove it because there is a difficulty. It looks like there could be some issues, in, uh, some kind of sliding issues, but a bit more advanced um, if the permutations are the same. And nevertheless, we don't see any attack, so we expect that these schemes achieve optimal security or asymptotically optimal security. Um, to conclude, I think mirror theory is a very powerful technique. Um, I don't think it's better or worse than the chi-square technique. It's different. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, it allows for approving optimal security or almost optimal security for various constructions. Um, interesting question are the single key variants. A dual of encrypted, Davis encrypted Wake McCarter Davis Meyer. I think this is also interesting because what we saw for uh, EDM versus EDMD, EDM and EDMD, the schemes are equally efficient, but encrypted Davis Meyer dual is way more secure, or is a bit more secure. And maybe the same could happen for the MAC functions. Um, and I expect there should be plenty of further applications for the mirror theory. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>